If you have your Bibles, I would like you to turn with me to Psalm 32. Um, thank God, be, be praying for Dale and Lisa. I noticed they left, and I don't know if she might not have been feeling good. Uh, last week, of course, she was here, and um, she took a, like a seizure, but I, I saw that they left. So please be, keep them in your prayers, okay? Uh, I'll have to call after church. Hmm? Psalm 32. This morning we're going to talk about forgiveness. Forgiveness. Remember last week I said that loving isn't liking and forgiving isn't forgetting. How many people have heard forgive and forget? Well, forgiving isn't forgetting. And people will say, how many people have heard this? And I've said this. When you get saved, God cast your sin into the depths of the sea of his forgetfulness. How many people have heard that? How many people have said that? Now, go find it in the Bible for me. Go ahead, get your concordance out. Go to your computer and type it in. Sea of forgetfulness is not there. Okay? When we talk about forgiveness, we're not talking about forgetting. It's two different things. There are some things we can forget. Somebody cuts you off in traffic, and you can forget about that. You can forget about that. Somebody has a little minor, you know, you get a little minor tiff with somebody in your family. You, you can forget about that. But there's some things you can never forget. And God, who knows everything from before the beginning of time until the end, it's, it's hard for me to imagine. If he knows what's going to happen a thousand years from now, I don't know if God can forget. Forgiving isn't forgetting. It's something much different. It's something much deeper and it's something much more lasting. Forgiveness is so much more than just letting it go. Look at Psalm 32. We're going to read and we're going to look at God's forgiveness and then we're going to look a little bit of what he wants from us as his people. David wrote this psalm, and David knew something about God's forgiveness. He knew something about God's forgiveness. He said, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. The word for forgiven in the Old Testament really means lifted. It means lifted. Blessed is the man whose sin is forgiven, uh, whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Now, it doesn't say anything there about you can't undo things that have been done. And, of course, if you know the history of David and the sins that he committed, there were two major ones that's recorded in the Scriptures. He could never go back and undo what he had done. But his sins were forgiven. His sins were covered. Blessed is the man, in verse 2, unto whom... The Lord imputes not iniquity, and in whose spirit is no guile. Now, this first passage that we're reading talks about God's forgiveness. What his forgiveness is, it's a lifting of the weight of our transgression. You know, when you sin, there's a, a weight on you, isn't there? How many know what I'm talking Especially if you know the Lord. Obviously, there's some people in the world that have no conscience, you know, and they'll walk around in public without any clothes on and not feel any... But if you sin, there's a weight that comes upon you. You know what I'm talking about. And when God forgives that sin, he lifts that weight off of us. The consequences, the, the payment for everything was placed on Christ. David said, blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputes not iniquity. That means that when he forgives us, he no longer holds us responsible. He no longer has us in the payment plan. He releases. He lifts. He forgives. 
And he lets us. He doesn't, it doesn't undo the consequences of what has been done. But what it does is it, it, it relieves us from the, the uh, responsibility of paying the fine. Okay? He doesn't impute iniquity to us. He doesn't hold it against us. Instead, he releases it. He undoes it. Okay? Forgiving means to lift. Now, does God forget? Turn over to Psalm 103. Just going to look at a couple passages here in the Old Testament. Then we're going to look to the New. <clears throat> and uh, we're just going to read. We'll start with verse 1. I, I do want to read down to verse 12. He says this, starting at verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Here's one of them. Who forgives all your iniquities. Who heals all your diseases. Who redeems uh, your life from destruction who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that the youth is, thy youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenty of mercy. Thank God. Thank God that he's slow to anger. Thank God that he has enough mercy that he'll, he'll cause somebody to stand up in front of a congregation and give a word of rebuke or chastisement or warning. A plea. Sometimes when somebody does us wrong, that's it. Have you ever, have you ever shut the door? Somebody have done you wrong? Thank God he's merciful. He will not always chide, thank the Lord. Neither will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. If he had, we'd all be burning in hell right now. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. Now, 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. He's removed them. He's taken them away. It doesn't say he's forgotten them. He's removed them. See, there's one thing. If somebody does you wrong, and you just shrug and say, oh, well, okay. It's another thing if you get down to that deep, deep, deep place where that scar is. Instead of just bearing it, you say, okay, I want, Lord, I want to deal with this. I want to forgive. What, he's, what it says here is he's removed our transgressions from us. He's removed the penalty. He's removed the stigma of the guilt of what we've done. He hasn't undone the consequences. It hasn't gone back in time and changed everything. But in his mercy and in his loving kindness and in his graciousness, he has taken them away for those who fear him. For those who love him, for those who call him their God, he's given us forgiveness. As far as the east is from the west, it doesn't say as far as from the north is to the south, because if you keep going north, eventually you'll get to the end. If you get, keep going north, north, you'll get to the North Pole, and then you start going south. But if you keep going east, you'll never stop going east. See, as far as from the east is to the west, that's inf infinity. That means when he's removed our sins, our transgressions, he's removed them for good. It doesn't say he's forgotten them. It says he's removed them. You see, I want you, I want, I want you to get a picture of forgiveness. Because when we start looking in the New Testament about us, I want you to have this in your mindset. But if you're going to forgive somebody, this is, what, this is what's going on, okay? Look at another passage of Scripture in Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, chapter 38. And uh, we'll read verse 17. In 
in verse 17 of chapter 38, and again, we can't really put this in context because it would take a lot. It would take a lot. But look at verse 17. Isaiah speaks. He says, Behold, well, this is the Lord speaking through the prophet Isaiah. Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption. For thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. It says here that what another thing God does when we talk about forgiveness, he puts our sins behind him, behind his back. He leaves them in the past. And he doesn't go back and drag them out again. He puts them behind him. Okay? He doesn't forget them. Puts them behind him. One more passage in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 43. And verse 25. The Lord is speaking through the prophet again. He says, I, even I, am he that blots out thy transgressions for mine own sake and will not remember thy sins. And somebody says, oh look, now you see? It says he forgets our sins. So Pastor Carmen, he got it wrong now because the word says he forgets our sins. He doesn't remember them. But you have to understand, he's not talking about wiping them out. When he talks about remembering here, he's talking about punishment. He says, I'm not going to come back on you for the things you've done. I won't remember your sins. I won't, I won't bring judgment. I put them behind me. I've lifted them off of you. I've imputed righteousness unto you. And I'm not going to come back in a month or a year or ten years and say, you remember what you did? Oh, we like to do Don't we like to do that? Now, I'm going I'm to make somebody mad at me. But I have found, I should keep my mouth shut. I have found that, that some folks are prone to remembering Things that happened a long time ago. And this, I'll, just quote, I'll just quote Judge Judy. Can I just do that? She says, women remember things that happened years and years and years ago. Huh? You know, men, I know me. My wife will say something to me. and not even, It doesn't even have to be anything bad. But she could say, oh, you remember back, you know. And I'll say, I don't know what you're talking about. And she'll, like, she'll read off every detail of what we were wearing and where we were. <laughs> That's, that's, that's okay sometimes, but whenever you remember stuff that was done, see, forgiveness keeps that stuff back. Doesn't bring it back up. That's what, when he talks about remembering here, that's what he's talking about. I don't believe God's capable of absolutely forgetting everything because he knows everything. But he, he keeps it back. He keeps it in the sea. He keeps it behind him. He doesn't drag it up again. Once he forgives, he forgives. And his forgiveness is done. It never comes up again. Okay? One more passage in the Old Testament. And this is where the sea of forgetfulness comes from. Okay? It's a little... Folks get things and they put things together in a different way. Over in Micah, which is uh, a, a minor prophet, and you have to look a little bit for Micah. Uh, it's back there. Okay? And the 12 minor prophets, right after Obadiah and Jonah and those places. Okay, I'll give you a little time to find it because unless you're a real good Bible scholar, you've got to look in the uh, table of contents. I've I got to do too. In the very last chapter of Micah, starting in verse, we'll, we'll just read verse 18. Chapter 7 <clears throat> and verse 18. When the prophet says this, we all still hear pages turn. Okay. Who is a God like unto, unto thee that pardons iniquity and passes by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retains not his anger forever because he delights in mercy. Micah, of course, prophesied about the same time as Isaiah. The nation, uh, the, the, 
Jerusalem, Judah, the tribe of Judah, had fallen into gross idolatry and sin. And, and the prophets, God was sending prophets to warn them. And he was saying, listen, I'm warning you. You need to straighten up. He says, I love you. I care about you. That's why I'm, I'm sending these prophets to you. He's saying, he pardons iniquity, passes by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He retains not his anger forever because he delights in mercy. Verse 19, he will turn again. He will have compassion on us. He will subdue our iniquities, and thou will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. See, now a lot of people will get this, and they'll put that together with forgetfulness. But it doesn't say anything here about forgetting. It talks about casting them into the ocean, burying them, never to be brought up again. You know, we like to cast things into the ocean, but we leave a rope tied to them. We like to throw things behind us, but we always have that little thread just in case we've got to use it for something. But God's forgiveness is so complete. Does he forget? In a practical sense, he doesn't remember because he's not going to punish us for something he's forgiven. But does he forget? No, he, he puts it away. He buries it in the ocean. He puts it behind him. He lifts it off of us. Forgiveness is not forgetting. Forgiveness is a release. When you forgive somebody, you release them from the demands, from the penalties of what they've done. And when somebody does something to you, or if somebody has done something to you, you hold that. It's natural. We hold them. We, we have, a, we have a, 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 a penalty phase, okay, like they have in court. You know, they have the, the guilt phase, then the penalty phase. We have the penalty phase. We're going to make sure that they pay even if, if, even if, they, if, even if they're dead, dead or gone, we, we have this thing that we hold on to. We remember that thing, and we, and we want to we wanna see them pay. We want our pound of flesh. That's what unforgiveness is about. It's not about forgetting. It's about releasing, releasing that person. In reality, when you hold a person in unforgiveness, you're really the one in bondage. You're really the one in chains. Releasing that person releases you to be the man or woman that God wants you to be. Because as long as we harbor unforgiveness, and I have been there. Don't, I'm not standing up here telling you that, I've, yeah, I mean, I've dealt with that a long time ago. I don't care who you are. You're always dealing with something that somebody's done to you. Jesus talked a lot about, you know, making things right and so forth. And, and that's, another, that's another message for another time. But I just, I just want to impress you with this idea of what God's forgiveness is. Releasing. Now, with all that in mind, I want you to turn with me to Paul's letter to the church at Colossae. Colossians. Colossians. Learning the heart of God. Now we want to learn how to apply it to this temple. We'll read chapter 3. We'll just start with verse 1 and just read down because we've got lots of time. <clears throat> if you go back to chapter 2, and we're not going to read chapter 2, Paul warned the church at, at Colossae about religion. How many people know that religion can be a very deadly thing? R religion has, uh, he talks about Worshiping angels and will worship, and he talks about uh, uh, you know aestheticism, what do, you know, starving yourself and beating yourself, doing all these things, religious practices that people kind of think that somehow please God. God's not interested in our religious practice; He's interested in our faith in Him. Okay, so. Paul, and you can read chapter 2 and, and get an idea of what he talks about. Rules that people make. You know, sometimes folks make rules. Can do this, can't do that. You've got to dress like this. You've got to but we have rules. Okay. Paul says, watch out for people that make a lot of rules. Okay, it's one thing. Scriptural thing is one thing. But, I've, you know, I've known folks that they make rules. You know, if you want to come to this church, you've got to. Mm, mm, mm. And if you don't, somebody's going to come up to you and let you know. Now, that's chapter 2. Chapter 3, Paul says this. 
If you then be risen with Christ, if you're a believer, if you have been dead, buried, and risen again with Christ, not necessarily the act of baptism, but in faith, if you're a new creature in Christ, seek those things that are above. My goodness, what our sister shared with us. What are we seeking after? You know, I find out when I get all messed up in my mind, and I get that way sometimes, it's because I find my eyes getting off the things of God and getting on the things of this world. When I start looking at stuff, when I start looking at things, and I say, Lord, how come this one got it and I don't got it? How come this one can have it and you pass me over? Anybody ever feel that way? Am, I'm, am I the only one? I just go ahead and leave. I'll just preach to myself for the next time. If you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above and not on things of the earth. For you are dead. Can you say, I'm dead? I'm not the grateful dead. I'm dead. Okay. Okay. Well, I am the grateful dead. I'm grateful for what Christ did, but not that's a different one. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, and I'm just reading down to where I want to get. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. That's what we're looking forward to. So he says this in verse 5. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. That word mortify in the King James means kill, put to death. Those things that's within you, that are looking to the things of the world and not to the things of God. We need to, we need to identify those things. and We need to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put these things to death. I'm going to put these things down. I'm going to kill them. He says, therefore you're, uh, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. And now he gives this big long list of ugly lists. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence. That's, that's the King James way of saying lust. Uh, uh, covetousness, which is idolatry. Covetousness, which... Covetousness, which is idolatry. You've got to repeat that. Covetousness. Wanting what somebody else has. It's like worshiping idols. With the, with the, you know, the word we had this morning. Okay, now listen to what he says. For which thing's sake, the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience. In the which time you also walked sometime when you lived in them. But now, also put off all these things. Uh, you know, the, the apparent things, you know, the sexual sins and all that stuff. Okay, but now he's talking about anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. We, we need to, you know, we, after we get pe- past the major sins, then we need to start looking inside for those, those, you know, ingrown ones. Those ones that we've nurtured for a long time. Those ones that make us feel comfortable when we get mad and we can lash out. Lie not one to another, he says in verse 9. Seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. Do you know sometimes it's hard not to lie? (laughs) You see, and a a lie is a lie. It could be a big lie. Or it could be like a little... I kind of like that one commercial where uh, Abraham Lincoln, Honest Abe, I think it's an insurance company commercial. His wife is there, and his wife says, does this dress make me look fat? (laughs) And Abraham Lincoln, he just goes like this. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Verse 9. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. Verse 10. And have put on the new man, which is renewed. Now, the new man. Now, this is what we ought to be as believers in Christ. If you're not a believer in Christ, this don't, it's don't count. But if you're a believer in Christ, here's what he says. Put on. Put on the new man. You know, this is an action that we take. It doesn't just happen. It's not automatic. We keep talking. We've been talking over the last couple of weeks about diligence. We have to, listen, this just, just doesn't happen by itself. We have to make an effort as believers, not an effort to be saved, because we're saved by faith in the blood of Jesus, but an effort to be the people that Christ wants us to be. He's saying, put on. We need, every morning we need to put on. We talk about putting on the armor of God, 
But we need to put on the new man. You're a new man, a new woman. You've got to wear that thing. A lot of people think it's just going to happen. But you have to make an, a decision, a conscious decision, an effort. He says, put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. In other words, one of the things we have to do if we need to put on the new man is we have to have that knowledge of Christ through his word. Verse 11, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. Now, this is where I wanted to, I read all that to get here. Put on therefore, every morning we need to wake up and decide we're going to put on, the, which man, we're, what, what outfit we're going to wear that morning. You know, just like you wake up in the morning, what am I going to wear today? Am I going to be that old man I used to be? Or am I going to put on a new man? You have that choice. Some people don't think they have the choice. You have a choice. He says, Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved. That's us. We're holy and we're beloved. Bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, You've got to arm yourself with this stuff when you first wake up because if you don't, something's going to happen within the first 45 minutes is going to make you lose your cool. You all know what I'm talking about. You're going to make a decision that no matter what happens that day, you're going to be as Christ-like as you can be through the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of you. Kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Now here we go. Forbearing one another. Oh, sometimes it's so hard to put up with people. In your family. Anybody here grow up in a big family? I didn't. I just had, I just had a brother. And I, my, he had to put up with me. I had an older brother. And I used, to, uh, I used to give him grief all the time. I did. He put up with me. Some of you guys know my brother. And... and but you grow up in a family, you know what, you've got to put up with some things, don't you? And they've got to put up with you. In, in, a, in, a, in a church family, sometimes we've got to forbear one another. You know why? Because going back to last week, what we said last week, loving isn't liking. <laughs> you don't have to like everybody, but you've got to love everybody. It's different. Okay? We've got to forbear. That means if somebody's getting on your nerves, now what, what Jesus said, there's, there's a way to deal with that. You're supposed to go to them in love and say, hey, let's talk about this. Let's work this out. If you're not willing to do that, then he says, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. Does that mean forgetting? Hmm. Putting it behind you? Burying it in the ocean? Lifting it off of that one? Lifting the, the payment, the, the, the demand for payment of sins? Releasing. Just what God does when he forgives. Does he just pretend like nothing ever happened? Does he just forget about it? No, but, but he, instead he removes... The stigma of guilt. And he forgives. Sometimes forgiveness has to be preceded with, uh, preceded with, you know, a coming together. Sometimes that's the case. But in all things, we need to be willing to release. And not just in the body, because he's talking here about in the body, but in your lives. And, and I've said this before, I know that if I went through these pews right now, and I know personally, because I know some of you, but I, you know, I don't know everybody, everything about everybody, but I know that there are people in here who were wounded and scarred years ago, betrayed, left alone, abused. Those kinds of scars never go away. And to tell somebody, well, you just need to forget about it, that's impossible. But it's not impossible to forgive. He says this. 
forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all, put all, uh, above all these things, put on charity or love, which is the bond of perfectness. It's the perfect union is established in love. And, you know, we could go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You go read it about five times a day for the next couple weeks and find out what it says. It doesn't hold things. It doesn't keep a list of wrongs. It does, it is willing to release. Even as Christ forgave you. Every one of us has experienced the release. We've experienced the lifting. We've experienced God taking our sin and putting it in a seat. We've experienced God refusing to want to wanna punish us for something that he's forgiven. We've all experienced that. We've all received that as believers. How much more should we be willing? Jesus told a parable. We all know it. You've all heard it. It's a parable about a fella that owed a lot of money. To, to the ruler, to the king, to the Lord. And he went, and if you read various interpretations of that parable, some, some will say he owed him a million dollars, just a, a vast amount of money. And, and he couldn't pay it. And he appeared before the Lord, and the Lord said, throw him in debtor's prison. Take his family, take whatever he has. And the guy pleaded, and he said, please, Forgive me the debt, please. I'll try to pay it, please. So the Lord had compassion. Remember last week we talked about the Good Samaritan that had compassion? He had compassion. He said, I forgive you. I forgive you. I released. Scratch it off. Put it behind me. Put it in the depths of the ocean. I'll lift it off you. I'll blot it out. Go ahead. God bless you. But we know the story. With that, with that servant did. He went out. And he found somebody who owed him five bucks. And he grabbed him and he said, I want my money. And the guy begged and pleaded and said, please, please, just give me some time. I'll get you your money. And the servant said, uh-uh. Send him to debtor's prison. It's not the end of the story. Because when the Lord heard about it, he called him back in and he said, you know what? I forgave you a million dollars. And you can't forgive one of your fellow servants who's no better or worse than you, five bucks. He rescinded his forgiveness. You know, Jesus said it. In fact, let's close with this. Over in Matthew, chapter uh, 6, and uh, we, we, know, we know this, we know this by heart. Chapter 6 and verse 9. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. Jesus was teaching his disciples how to pray. This is actually the Sermon on the Mount. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We could all say it by heart. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. When I was a kid, I grew up in a church where we had to memorize this and repeat it over and over and over again. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And we didn't have a, a clue of what we were saying. How many people say the Lord's Prayer, quote unquote? It's really not the Lord's Prayer. This is actually a sinner's prayer. The Lord didn't have to pray this. He gave it to us to pray. He says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth, in earth, not on earth, Pastor Harold reminded me of that one time. In earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Okay, now, verse 12. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. As we forgive our debtors. You know, I'm, I'm finding out 
God treats me like I treat others. He treats me like I treat others. With the amount, with the willingness that I'm, I have of, of forgiving others, that's the willingness that God will have of forgiving me. And again, I'm not necessarily speaking of in heaven or in hell, but in, in bearing my sins. See, forgiveness is about, uh, when you're forgiven, you don't have to bear your sins anymore. Because he takes them off of you. He releases you. He puts them behind him. He puts them in the depth of the ocean. They're not yours anymore. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Verse 14. Yeah, everybody stops there, but we've got to read verse 14. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father. But Jesus is saying that. It's not a commentator. That's not some preacher. That's not somebody's... That's what Jesus is saying that. If we want to be able to move and live and breathe in Christ and be everything that God wants us to be, we're not able to do it if we're still bearing our sins in a practical sense. If we want God to release us, we need to be willing to release those who have done us wrong. Forgiving isn't forgetting. Loving isn't liking. Forgiving isn't forgetting. Forgiving is releasing. I want to ask you this morning. Is there someone you need to release this morning? Is there a person? They might be dead and gone. But they're still there. What they've done is still there. The hurt. The shame. The betrayal. The pain. You know what I'm talking about. For those of you that have somebody, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And you know exactly in your heart and mind, you know exactly who it is. Because you've never, you've never let them go. And they're always, it's always present there. It might, it might be something that happened a week ago or 25 years ago. It doesn't matter. It's always there. That thing is always on you. That weight is on you. Do you want to be released this morning? You need to be willing to release that one. They don't deserve it. Because if they deserved it, it wouldn't be forgiveness. I didn't deserve to be saved. I didn't deserve for, for Christ to die for me. Nor did you. But he was willing to do it. And the ultimate expression of God's love for us is when Jesus was hanging on that cross. And he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And as the absolute, and I'll, I'll leave you with this, as the absolute measure of, of, of the proof of the fact that God doesn't forget when he forgives, Jesus still bears in his hands and in his feet and on his side the scars of what he received on the cross. See, for all of eternity, we're going to remember that he lifted, put our sins behind him, put him in the depths of the sea. But those scars will always be there. We'll never have an opportunity to forget what Jesus did for us on the cross. And when he was hanging there, and those Pharisees, and the scribes, and all the people that hated him, the people who were partially responsible for putting him there, in, in, again, in the practical sense. They were all standing there at the base of the cross and they were mocking him. They were, they, were, they were making light of the Son of God being crucified. Talking to him like he was a common criminal. And he never done anything wrong. Yet instead of hanging there and cursing them and condemning them to hell and threatening them with every kind of eternal damnation, he said, Father... Forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. I want to ask you this morning, is there somebody that you need to forgive? 
I want to pray. And we're going to close. Is there somebody you need to forgive? Might be somebody in your family, somebody in this room. Might be somebody that's, like I said, dead and gone. Doesn't matter. If you want to be the man or woman of God, everything that he wants you to be, then you need to release that one. I want to pray. Just stand with me as we pray. See, I... I'm, 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 I sensed the Spirit of God. I sensed the Spirit of God calling, calling names, calling, speaking a name in your, in your spirit right now. I sense this, I just, God is reaching out. He's calling you this morning. I want to pray. You can stay where you're at or you can come up here. It's up to you. Because this is between you and God. I like to I always say that. Sometimes we have prayer where we call up, and sometimes this is just this is personal. This is your this is your penile. This is your place where you come face to face with God and what is what you're dealing with. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I ask you for those who are in the sound of my voice this morning. That God, as you have spoken to us through your word, you've given us a word, and now you're calling us. Many have struggled for years with resentment and anger and bitterness over scars that have been inflicted upon them. God, this morning, you have called us to this place to present to us your word, to plead with us to come, let us reason together. As you have forgiven our sins, as you have lifted them off of us, as you have taken our sins and put them in the, in the deep parts of the sea, as you have put them behind you, as you no longer wish to punish us for our sins because of the blood of Jesus. So, Lord, we want to be in that place where we can say, where we could be set free from the, this, this burden, this bondage that we have, that we've held against somebody for months, years, however long it is. Father, we pray that you would release us this morning. We, we come and we, we bring, our, we bring our, our unforgiveness to the cross this morning. We repent of all those times when we thought evil of that person. And we ask you, Lord, to set us free. As we set them free, as we release them, Father, you would release us. If any feel led to just come that we might pray with you, won't you come? As we just stand here. If you feel led to come, just come and stand. You know who that person is. You don't have to tell me. I'm not going to ask you who it is. I'm not going to ask you what it's about. God knows. If you're burdened, if, you're, if the weight of unforgiveness is resting on you, just come. Just come. I'm going to ask my wife to come and pray with me. Won't you come, please? Won't you come?